So, so the the questions and the conversation. I want to maybe hit some of the high high points that that we talked that you talked about in previous interviews, but also uh, reflect on on the past twenty years, and then uh, look into the future. And none of us know uh, what role railroads will play in the future. But uh, we, even though we're the Hall of Fame and we're interested in history, we're also uh, concerned about what what this, uh, how this industry will be in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, I think just to, um, to start out at the beginning and, and with this uh, rich history that you have in your own family in railroading, what was, what's your earliest memory of, of trains? Uh, what do you, what do you, can you remember when you first became aware that you were in a, a railroad family or in the railroad environment? Yeah, my dad was a uh, conductor uh, on the Missouri Pacific Railroad, and I was born in Atchison, Kansas, but uh, right after I was born, we moved out to Stockton, Kansas, which is just north of Hayes, Kansas, because uh, he did not have enough seniority to hold the job in Atchison, so we had to go to Stockton. And uh, anyway, I was uh, I grew up there, and I remember going down and seeing him when he'd come in and get off the trains and come home and so on. So uh, that's, and at that time, I mean, I was three, four years old. So so I, I grew up in a railroad environment, yes. uh, as you know, fourth generation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, but that's that's the first uh, memory. And, and one thing that is interesting, not at that age I didn't do it, but later on when I was like nine or ten years old, uh, I would go out with my dad and ride the trains and ride cabooses and uh, locomotives and so on. And you just can't imagine that in today's environment right. uh, with all the legal issues and so <laughs> on. But but that was just uh, kind of a way of life back then in the yeah. railroad business yeah. that, that fathers took their sons out and rode on trains with them. Were, were many of your friends also in railroad families that you? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I lived uh, on the west side of Atchison, Kansas, and it was uh, predominantly Irish Catholic railroad part of town, mm-hmm. and uh, clearly uh, blue collar, and uh, and we lived uh, less than three blocks from the uh, switching yard down mm-hmm. there, so. Uh, I grew up listening to cars banging uh, down in the yards down mm-hmm. there. And then yeah. there was a um, hill when you left uh, Atchison to go to Omaha, and it was called the Shannon Hill. Mm-hmm. And again, because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the workers there were Irish, and so it was called Shannon Hill. So those locomotives would be roaring going up Shannon Hill uh-huh. at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning and you could hear those. So, so I, I grew up with all of them. These were all steam? All steam. Uh, no, at that time, uh, the steam was being phased out in, mm-hmm. the, in the 1950s. Okay. And uh, so uh, mostly diesels were coming in, but there were a few steam engines left. And ever, that's one thing I would do in Atchison. If I heard a steam engine was coming uh-huh. through town, we would make sure we went down and saw it. And, mm-hmm. I remember one time when I was with my dad uh, up in Hastings, Nebraska, uh, when mm-hmm. I was out on the train with him. Um, we had diesel locomotive, but uh, the Union Pacific also went into uh, uh, Hastings, uh, Nebraska, and so the crew let me get up on the steam engine that they were using to switch cars. So, uh, so that was. I've really been cool. to Hastings. And, oh, have you? Uh, and on the way to Red Cloud, Nebraska, oh, where yeah. uh, Willa Cather. Uh, the great writer grew up in Red Cloud yep. and wrote about trains and wrote a lot of uh, a lot of railroad uh, railroading figures into her her novels. So Hastings is a, a well known yeah. uh, because of her of her writing. I think at that time I was probably ten or eleven years old. So that that's pretty amazing. Do you have any uh, was there was there, was there any uh, memory of a particular Incident like riding through a blizzard or, or um, uh, a, a derailment or a something that happened in your youth that your father, um, as a conductor, 
either you were with him or or, or he talked about it? Uh, no, I, I wasn't with him when something like that happened. But uh, the one thing I heard about uh, all of my life is when he got promoted from brakeman to conductor, uh, the uh, first trip that he made between Atchison and Concordia, Kansas, uh, the train derailed. Yeah, and that was his very first trip oh, as a conductor. And uh, so, uh, and it was a track defect. It wasn't uh, uh, uh -huh. anything that the crew did. And yeah. uh, But anyway, uh, uh, I heard about that uh, constantly. And, and there were times that uh, I remember that he was supposed to be home at a certain time and they'd get caught in snowstorms mm -hmm. and things yeah. like that. So, some Some kids grow up uh, in an environment like that and they and what's in their mind is i i can't wait to get out of this uh out of this small town or i'm this is not for me but you didn't you you seemed like you were going to be a railroad person uh right was there ever any doubt uh, what that you that this was going to be your well your it, calling you know uh i've always loved uh, the railroad business and again uh you know, growing up in a, in a railroad family, I mean, that's virtually all I knew about and all I heard when I grew up. And in fact, uh, there in Atchison, uh, right on the corner, uh, we had a house and right next to us was my dad's first cousin, uh, Thomas uh, Sullivan, and he was a uh, conductor and we actually called him Uncle Tommy. Uh -huh. And uh, And every Saturday morning, uh, all the local railroaders from around there would come over and they would talk about the railroad business. Yeah. And, uh, and mostly they, uh, talked about how terrible the management was. Uh -huh. But, uh, uh, -huh. uh, so anyway, I would, I would go over there and I'd sit there and I would listen to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so anyway, I really wanted, uh, to go into the railroad business. And my dad did not want me to go into the railroad business. Uh, he told me that you need to go to college, you need to get a job doing something besides the railroad business. He said, mm -hmm. literally, his quote was, it's a dog's life. And what he was talking about is, you know, they were on call 24 hours a day if you were on the extra board and so on. And, mm -hmm. and then again, like I say, you know, he, he had over 20 years uh, seniority and he couldn't even hold the job in Atchison, and that's why he ended up, we were in Stockton, and then he came back to Atchison, then he yeah. ended up in Concordia, Kansas, mm -hmm. because of the uh, seniority. Of course, the railroad business back in the 1950s and 1960s wasn't doing all that great, right. and uh, so he didn't really want me to go to work in the railroad business, and uh, but I was uh, determined that I wanted to to do it and I just stayed after him and stayed after him and uh, and when I was getting ready to turn 19 he finally uh, took me down and talked to the uh, local superintendent uh, mm -hmm. there and it was Ab Reese Sr. Mm -hmm. and his son later on Ab Reese Jr. ended up working uh, for me at Santa Fe and then also Kansas City Southern but uh, uh, he uh, saw to it that I got to go to work uh, uh, that summer. And what my dad was worried about is that I was going to make a lot of money, which I did, uh -huh. uh, because you worked uh, 16 hours a day. I mean, literally, I would work either 16 hours straight or eight on, eight off, eight on, eight off, virtually almost all the summer and, and did make a uh, significant amount of money. And he was worried that I was going to make a lot of money and decide, boy, I didn't want to go back to to uh, college. But uh, so anyway, the, yeah, I, I, start, I started on my 19th birthday. As a brakeman? or As, as a, a switchman, switchman. And, and, and a brakeman. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I was a switchman there in Atchison. And then from Atchison to Concordia, it was 150 miles by rail. And um, you had all these green elevators all along there. And and sometimes you'd go out as a brakeman and you'd stop and uh, 
uh, maybe switch uh, 14, 15, 16 different elevators uh, mm-hmm. along the way. Mm-hmm. And you would spot empties going out, and then you would pick up loaded grain uh, coming back. And literally uh, every trip took 16 hours. Uh-huh. And that was not messing around. You'd stop and mm-hmm. take 20 minutes to go to lunch, and that yeah. was it. Well, I, that kind of experience, given what you went on to do, did that shape you in any way or help define how you approached management later on? I mean, having been yeah. literally from the ground up, uh, yeah. which, is, uh, which is unusual. Yeah, very much so. And uh, incidentally, uh, Mr. Reese, uh, uh, just to kind of tell the story here, my, my dad dropped me off at uh, school uh, in September, and he said, now I want you to promise me that you're going to go to college because, you know, and I said, yeah, Dad, I'm going to finish college. And and literally uh, about five weeks later, I get a call uh, while I'm in class at Kansas State uh, in Manhattan, and, and my dad died. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. so anyway, so I went home, and uh, my grandmother had... Uh, raised me because uh, uh, my mother died when I was uh, six years old, just turned six, and she died then two weeks later. So oh. I was on my own. So what did oh. I do? Oh. I immediately quit school, mm-hmm. and I worked. Uh, they were moving a lot of corn uh, during the winter that winter. So Mr. Reese told me that. He said, you have a job until the next semester, and then I will see to it that you work every summer. Uh, and then when you graduate from college, I will recommend you to go through the Missouri Pacific Management Training Program. But you have a job till the next semester and you are going back to work. So he really influenced my life mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and uh, so made me, uh, made me go back to school. Yeah, I think that these people who turn up in our lives uh, key moments are so uh, so interesting especially when you went through such a uh, right. uh, emotional time losing your father and grandmother in the same damn, period so he must have been a really influential what was you know was he was a railroad guy but he was uh, more of a mentor to you yeah he he really was and and one of the things you asked the question you know did and and incidentally the next summer the first summer that there was not that much grain moving so actually i ended up working on the track game and i, I was oh. a track mm-hmm. labor and i remember i played football in high school in high school and college so i thought well you know i'm a pretty tough guy I go out there i remember uh, i went to work uh, by the time i got off uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon I, I was in bed and did not get up <laughs> until the next morning Working on a track gang, I saw how hard those guys work. So it really did influence me tremendously coming mm-hmm. from the ground up and knowing everything that was done. And in fact, uh, when I was a first line supervisor with a lot of these uh, folks, particularly in train service, uh, you know, they might try and tell me some story uh, that this happened or that happened. And I said, hey, uh, forget about that. I've been there, done that. Uh-huh. Uh, so I, there's nothing that I haven't done that you've done, so I know all about it. So it, yeah. And well, anyway, they, they actually ended up respecting that. Sure. Yeah, and you, you, would, you had actually been there yeah. and, could, and, uh, and knew firsthand what they would, and that gave you a empathy, but also gave you a little um, chance to, to, uh, right. to uh, have a reality check, I guess. Right. Um, was it was that was it more dangerous in those days uh, in those jobs than yes. it is today? Yeah. Did you witness any? Uh, yeah. It was. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, back uh, when I was a brakeman, uh, Atchison was built on kind of the side of a hill. So when they would uncouple the cars to go to couple. It was almost like a hump yard, except uh-huh. except they didn't have any devices that that you know would control the car. So what you'd have to do is you would have to be up on the car as a switchman and ride it and set the handbrake so that it didn't slam into another another car. Uh-huh. So you had to constantly climb up there, 
And then also they had, back in those days, what were, were called catwalks, mm -hmm. where on top of boxcars, you actually walked across the top of, uh, of the cars. And, and I had a, a fellow that I knew real well that was actually standing on top of a car uh, and hit a bridge and knocked him off. And uh, uh, in fact, out in the neighborhood where we lived, um, uh, again, pretty much an Irish Catholic neighborhood, uh, they always kept clean sheets out there because down uh, in the yard down there, and of course this was actually before my time, but mm -hmm. it just shows you kind of how dangerous it was. Uh, when they'd have sleet, snow, bad weather, something like that, there literally sometimes could be one to two to three people killed. And the, and all of the families kept white sheets out there that, that they'd bring the body in. Wow. That, that goes back to the early 1900s, 1920s, and so on. Of course, by the time I started, it was the oh. 1960s. But right. it was it was still more dangerous then, certainly, than it is today. Mm -hmm. And and you didn't have the uh, rules that you have today. You didn't, you didn't have drug tests. You didn't drug and alcohol tests uh -huh. and so on. And I will tell you that it was uh, alcohol... Uh, on the job mm -hmm. uh, was mm -hmm. common, yes. even during the times uh, uh, in the 60s when mm -hmm. I was there before they put in uh, mandatory drug testing mm -hmm. and alcohol testing. Yeah. Yeah. I should ask about, I mean, you mentioned being an Irish Catholic family, How, um, uh, what role did the church play in those little towns? Would you, was there one church? Were there several churches? Or, well, it's uh, really uh, almost unbelievable, but Atchison uh, was a town of 10,000 people, and they had three different parishes in a town of 10,000, which is, <laughs> is unheard of. It's wow. St. Benedict, St. Joseph, and Sacred Heart. And on the west side of town, where we were, that was Sacred Heart. And then they also had... Uh, St. Benedict's College and all boys uh, Catholic College. Then they had Mount St. Scholastica uh, Catholic uh, College for ladies. And then they had an all boys Catholic high school, Moore Hill, and an all girls Catholic uh, school, Mount St. Scholastica mm -hmm. Academy. So um, very much a Catholic community, uh, particularly, you know, over on the west side of town, Again, we were kind of the maybe blue, uh, blue collar, maybe lower middle class or to middle class type folks, and and everybody went to to Sacred Heart mm -hmm. every Sunday, and uh, and there was a grade school there, and everybody went to uh, to the grade school, and then you went on and went to the high schools, and then you went to the colleges, and mm -hmm. and I went to St. Benedict's College right. uh, on a football scholarship. For one year, and then they dropped football, and I transferred. So, uh, <laughs> so then you went to K State, right? Uh, State. I, well, I, not, I did. Oh, I did go to K State. Immediately, yeah. I went to K State. I had a scholarship there, but when I quit, I never went back. Uh -huh. And uh, so I ended up. Um, I actually went to Maryville, Missouri, for a short period of time mm -hmm. uh, for what, one year. And the only good thing about that is, is that's where I met my wife, uh -huh. and uh, yeah. that that was the most important thing there, but mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, I didn't get along all that well with the coach, and I'd been offered a scholarship uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, University of Southwestern Louisiana at that time. It's now called University of Louisiana Lafayette, the Raging Cajuns. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, so I went down there. I had uh, uh, two years of eligibility left, and I went down and uh, and finished yeah. college, and yeah. I got my undergraduate uh, yeah. degree there. And, and Marlis and I then we got married, and uh, and uh, our daughter uh, was born there. Mm -hmm. And uh, my coach was Raymond Blanco, <clears throat> who had uh, graduated from St. Benedict's in Atchison, uh -huh. and then his wife later became the governor 
of Louisiana. Oh, Ka- yeah. Kathleen Blanco. Blanco, yes. right after the uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, right during yes. Hurricane yeah. Katrina, and she took a lot of flack that she yes, should she not. Did, yeah. She should not have taken. And yeah. let me tell you, she is a wonderful lady. That's and an interesting connection. What, what what position did you play? Uh, believe it or not, uh, I don't I don't look like it, but I was a, I'm a football ru- fan. I was a running back. Uh, uh, believe it or not, so I was uh, mm-hmm. at that time. Even you know, I was pretty good size back in the 1960s. To, yeah. I was uh, about 195 pounds, and that was pretty big for a running mm-hmm. back. Not yes. today, but uh, <laughs> but it was back then. Like 230 or 240, or yeah, so l- linemen were. Yes. If they were 230, that was a big line. Yeah. But uh, today, the running backs are 230. So you graduated from that school in, uh, in the Lafayette. late 60s? Yeah, yeah 1967. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, there was a decision about whether you were going to go into the Air Force or you were going to go uh, into railroads. or What, we, what was the uh, turning point there for you? Well, the turning point was is that uh, I, I truly wanted to be a jet pilot uh-huh. in, in the Air Force, mm-hmm. and uh, I took the the test, the written test, and so on, and scored well on that. So then I went to uh, the Air Force Base in Alexandria, Louisiana. I don't remember the name of it right now to take the physical, and uh, it ended up that. Uh, I did not pass the eye test. Uh, they said I didn't have perfect 2020 vision, which is interesting because I think it was meant to be that I wasn't supposed to pass that test because when I was 70 years old, I took an eye test and they said, you got perfect 2020 <laughs> vision. But uh, anyway, uh, wow. so I'd, uh, it, it, they were losing a lot of pilots in Vietnam and and so anyway, uh, I didn't pass the test. So I said, well, if I'm not going to be a pilot, I don't want to go into the Air Force. And mm-hmm. so they came back to me and said, you can be a navigator and we will upgrade you then to a pilot because they needed pilots. Mm-hmm. So I was waiting to get into officer's candidate school. And uh, uh, so I went up to Des Moines, Iowa, where my wife lived. And uh, we lived with her parents for a while. Mm-hmm. And I went to work as a switchman for the Rock Island Railroad. And uh, so I was working there. And then, uh, so I would, and everybody actually wanted me to become a stockbroker. So I interviewed with uh, Merrill Lynch mm-hmm. and, uh, and so on. But uh, I was really thinking maybe I really wanted to go into the railroad business. And I went over. And I interviewed with the Union Pacific in Omaha, and uh, they uh, advised me that I was not up to their standards, that uh, <laughs> that I that I wouldn't uh, uh, qualify to go into their management training program. And I told them that I had been approached by Missouri Pacific, and they said, "Well, you would be better off going with the uh, Missouri oh. Pacific." So I did, yeah. and. Uh, uh, probably later in my career, I came back to haunt the union. So, so, <laughs> so they might have wished they had done I that. bet. So then you went into their training program. Yes. And 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 this is this is something that was interesting as I was reading this. That at that time, late sixties, the whole idea of of management was changing, and and there were some new ideas coming in. And and can you talk about that a little bit? Because that to me. I'm always interested in these moments when a, uh, an industry so traditional, like railroads, where people were doing the same thing that the previous generation did, and there's this almost um, uh, code uh, of protocol that is hard to crack, and a culture, I guess, is what I'm, I want to call it. So, but but the music, but the uh, Missouri Pacific was really undergoing a, a, some changes at that time. Uh, yeah, but very, very much so. And uh, they had started a uh, management training program, and uh, they uh, had decided that they were going to hire college-educated people uh, to uh, come to work for them, and uh, that they also were changing to try and figure out how to computerize operations, mm-hmm. and that was the term that was used back then. Uh, computerize it, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so um, 
the uh, Southern Pacific had a uh, great management training program and really turned out a lot of great people. And uh, Missouri Pacific uh, hired a fellow named uh, Gurdon Sines, who had put in the perpetual inventory system mm -hmm. uh, on the Southern Pacific. And Downing Jinks, who was the head of Missouri Pacific and a tremendously uh, talented and entrepreneurial type individual that wanted to take the railroad industry to the next level. He hired Gurdon Signs. And uh, so when you went into the management training program, uh, you would go through that. It was to last a year. I, went, mm -hmm. I got through it, I think, in about eight or nine months. And mm -hmm. then, uh, then you would spend like a year as a first-line supervisor. And then you would go... Today it's called the uh, information technology, but back then I think mm -hmm. it was called the uh, computer department or whatever. Uh -huh. And uh, so um, I went up to uh, the Missouri Pacific had bought the Chicago and Eastern Illinois fifty one percent, and uh, Louisville and Nashville owned forty nine percent. And uh, so I got sent to, to the uh, CNEI to put in the pickle system and. Uh, mm -hmm. We would have, this was not what you would think of today. We had what were called these IBM uh, 402 machines. Punch and, cards. And then you had punch cards uh, on there. And every yeah. car, uh, every card would represent a car. So you would print out that. And then hmm. you would have you know, where you had these pigeonholes that represented tracks. So the yard master would then mark up where all the cars were going. So then there would be somebody over there that would take the cards and put them in the different pigeonholes. Uh -huh. And that's how you kept track of it. And that's how it all got started. Mm -hmm. And so my job was to implement the perpetual in inventory system, the pickle system, mm -hmm. as it's called, uh, uh, up in uh, Chicago. And... Uh, and then I. Uh, well, were you living in Chicago then? Uh, we did. Yeah, we we lived in Riverdale, mm -hmm. uh, down the south side, kind of a tough side of mm -hmm. town, mm -hmm. and uh, they kept trying to recruit me to be uh, a manager up there, and I wanted to get out of Chicago because of the cost of living and all of the stuff that was going on up there. But it was the late sixties. Uh, uh, this, this by then was, uh, when I went up there it was 1969. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah. so then in 1970, uh, I got a call and they advised me that I was the uh, night uh, train master mm -hmm. in charge of operations from South Chicago into Canal Street in Chicago through not too nice of areas. And, uh, we, in, we had at that time, 20, 27 different interchange points where we interchanged uh -huh. with other railroads. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh. so I was out at night all the time, and my poor wife was at home with mm -hmm. her daughter, and it was uh, quite an experience. And I was there right after the the riots that took place, the mm -hmm. Democratic uh, uh -huh. National Convention mm -hmm. that carried on for another two years. And, I mean, I literally would go or the tracks we operated over uh which were the cwi chicago and western in indiana down to canal street mm -hmm. i mean the high-rise apartments would be uh, they would be on fire and uh, in fact uh, our crew radioed in one time when a policeman got killed that they saw it happen right there and uh, okay. and then when i was working uh uh, we had gangs that were uh, robbing our trains, and uh, they mm -hmm. uh, would uh, bomb the trains uh, every night with Molotov cocktails. And they told us to stop the trains, so we could so they could rob them. Uh, but uh, sounds like the old Wild West or something. <clears> I tell you, it uh, was uh, close to it, and yeah. that's the reason that I ended up leaving. Missouri Pacific, mm -hmm. and that's how I ended up being, going Santa to the Santa Fe. Um, I just want to, before we get on to Santa Fe, I wanted to ask about this pickle system and this whole idea of introducing new ways of managing. How much, uh, it sounds like this was a perfect time for you as a young man to, to embrace this kind of change, but was there much resistance within the uh, 
older management to the, the computer or to doing things in a new way? Uh, yeah, you know, and uh, not only resistance to, to the computer side of it, uh, but uh, also resistance to hiring college-educated people uh, to come in to help run the, the railroad business. And uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, just not something prior to the 60s mm -hmm. that you saw very much of having college-educated people in the rail industry. And again, uh, uh, Missouri Pacific uh, had a tremendous management training program. And if you look around uh, it afterwards of some of the people that went on to run the nation's railroads, uh, uh, the majority of them went through the Missouri Pacific Management huh. Training Program, and the majority of them came from Kansas. For example, uh, Dick Davidson, mm -hmm. uh, Matt Rose worked as a switchman hmm. uh, at uh, in Atchison, Kansas, and then he went through the uh, Missouri Pacific Training Program. But uh, uh, Art Schoner, um, let's see. Uh, at, at one oh, uh, and uh, later on, uh, uh, John McPherson became uh, president. He was from Kansas, but he didn't go mm -hmm. through the Missouri Pacific program. But he did go through the uh, Santa Fe Management mm -hmm. Training Program. And at these these training programs, what, what was the emphasis on uh, more efficient uh, re use of resources or, or no, uh, they, labor relations or what did they? What, no, they wanted it? you to learn a little bit about uh, every uh, department and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, my wife and I lived in the suburb of St. Louis Fenton Missouri and unfortunately uh, I had to leave about every uh, Sunday afternoon and did not get home until Friday night and uh, so I was on the road most mm -hmm. of the time mm -hmm. so like the first uh, assignment I had was to come here to Kansas City and to work with the marketing and sales people when I spent six weeks here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, and then I went to the mechanical department and spent time down in Little Rock, Arkansas. And mm -hmm. then I would go out oh. on the track with the engineering people. And then I spent time in St. Louis with the human resources I people see. and the accounting people. They wanted you to not necessarily learn everything of exactly how to do it, but at least to make the connections mm -hmm. with people within yeah. the company mm -hmm. that were in these different departments. So when you went out and became a manager, you would know yeah. about every department. And it was just a fantastic training program. So you, you um, in effect, um, not only did you break in at a time when this management was becoming important, but from your own family history, you were the first to go not only to college, but to be in management. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that, yeah. that was that a uh, record? Was that a, were you aware of that at the time, or was your family? Oh, yeah, there? yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and it. Uh, and of course, by this time, uh, you traded your 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 little brakeman's cap for a, t a coat and tie, and yeah, uh, that's right. And back then, uh, when I was in Missouri, at Missouri Pacific, you were also required to wear a hat. Uh -huh. And in, uh -huh. in fact, when I went up to Chicago, sometimes uh, when I would go down uh, town and I'd be standing there and I'd have that hat on and people would think I was a detective. <laughs> <laughs> they came up and said, sir, I want to report to you. Guys. <laughs> but that, that was, uh, uh, it, it was very much different. I mean, you know, none of our uh, family uh, had ever uh ever been in management and we mm -hmm. you know pretty much uh union and of course you know that was during the time the 20s 30s 40s uh yeah. and so on but then tom sullivan uh who was also kind of a mentor for me uh he recognized the changes that were going on within the the rail industry and he was very proud that i was in management and he even told me, he said, you know, he said, as things do, he said, the pendulum has swung. At one time, I was over here, management was totally mistreating, you know, the employees and so on. And, and that's how unions got started. And he said, now it's over here. 
to where the unions are too powerful. And I mean, mm -hmm. this was a, mm -hmm. a union guy, our whole family was, but he understood that and was very supportive of mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. and management and yeah. gave me tremendous amount of advice. And the one piece of advice he gave me that I never forgot, he said, and he, he called me Mick, everybody, if you go back to my hometown, uh -huh. everybody calls me Mick instead of Mike. Mm -hmm. And he said, Mick, he said, one thing you need to understand, you are a rail road and you better take care of that road. And so that's one thing I always remembered. Mm -hmm. You better maintain the track. Mm -hmm. and, I, and over the years, I saw where people would neglect the track and let it go down and so on. And it cost you three times as much uh, to bring it back up mm -hmm. to the proper standard that, as opposed if you would have just kept maintaining it the yeah. way it should be. Such, a, such an obvious thing, but still it so is. so important. You know. But... Uh, but I wish we had, uh, well, this whole question of infrastructure today is just what you're talking about. And that's, that's so important to a, a healthy economy and, and certainly in that, in this industry. Yeah, it, um, it really is. And I'll tell you, the, the railroad industry, though, when you think about it, they maintain their own infrastructure. And not only that, but they pay taxes for the property that they are on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what mm -hmm. they what they do. Yeah. So now you're with the Santa Fe. You're finally uh, in the early '70s. You go and, and go with the, the Santa Fe. And who who were, who were instrumental in, in in getting you there? And, and uh, talk about a little of what your first uh, uh, assignments were. Okay. The uh, fellow that I worked for at uh, Missouri Pacific. Uh, his uh, uncle used to be a superintendent uh, on the CNEI. And so he knew mm -hmm. a fellow named Bob McMillan. And Downing Jinx started his first training program on the CNEI. Mm -hmm. And the first person to go through that was Bob McMillan. So Bob went on to become then the president of the CWI Chicago and Western Indiana and then the Kansas City Terminal Railway right here in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And then he was recruited to go to the Santa Fe. And so the fellow I worked for, as I was looking, he knew that I wanted to leave and do something else mm -hmm. instead of <clears throat> working all night and, and seeing the trains firebombed and all that. So he yes. made a connection for me to do an interview with Bob McMillan and then I went down there, and the fellow that walked in during the interview was Larry Cena. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Larry Cena basically became, uh, uh, over the years, my mentor, the person that I looked up to. Although I will tell you that, and I've told the story before, I, I don't think there's anybody on, on the Santa Fe that Larry Cena probably ripped into more than, than, than me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he was uh, he was constantly doing that, but and 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 there was also a rumor out because when I went to work for Santa Fe, they were just starting their management training program. They mm -hmm. were way behind, and that's part of the reason that they hired me is mm -hmm. because I was 25 years old. I'd already had experience as an assistant train master. In implementing perpetual inventory system and also being a train master. And I was 25 years old, so they were trying to get these young people mm -hmm. uh, to come. To, and, and Santa Fe at that time was, uh, in 1970, was a pretty staid organization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and they didn't hire people from the outside. In fact, uh, Again, Larry Cena is the guy that made sure I got hired and I went to San Bernardino. But uh, the rumor was that the only reason that I got uh, hired is because I was married to his daughter. So uh, he heard that story and a lot of times he would come out and if my wife was there, he'd go up and put his arm around and say, well, how's my daughter? You know, just, but uh, so, so he did that, but by the same time he might take me out and rip me uh, yeah. up one side and down the other. I remember one time we were with the board of directors and we got a red signal and I tried to tell him it was a signal failure and he didn't want to believe that. He was, uh, we, we called him the Italian stallion. He had a pretty good uh, temper and he was ripping me and 
And uh, so the general manager walked out and said, well, Mr. Cena, how's everything going? He said, terrible. He said, if anything is going to get, I can't, I can't say what the word was, he said, <laughs> but if anything's going to get messed up on the railroad, it's going to be on this division. This is the worst run division in the Santa Fe. And I was a superintendent. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's the end of my career. But, uh, but anyway, he, that, he would, that's the way he was. But he's like a football coach who just exactly. th thought that, like, uh, that and, this is the way to, uh, get a better, Performance from you, or, or yeah, you know, exactly, build, uh, build exactly. Loyalty. He was he was a tough guy, and he also he wanted to make sure that you know he was didn't look like he was showing favoritism uh -huh. to me, even though you know he was the guy that moved me up, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and you know after I went to San Bernardino when I was twenty five, then uh, in in fact I had been. <laughs> Supposed to go to Fresno, but the superintendent there said, "Hey, I can't take some 25-year-old kid from a foreign railroad coming over here. I'm the new superintendent. I need." And then, ironically, uh, about 20 months later, uh, I was promoted and I became his assistant. And uh -huh. I was the assistant superintendent. I was 27, and mm -hmm. and uh, I remember meeting with him, and I said, "You know, I know you don't didn't really want me up here." Uh, but I, I went to the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and uh, he slammed down. He said, you, GD, right, I didn't want you up here. So that's how I got started on that. <laughs> but yeah, I, was, then, I was reading that that was around St. Patrick's Day or something. Uh, were... I, I actually, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, on St. Patrick's Day, I found out that I had been made the acting superintendent in Richmond, California, on mm. March the 15th. They hadn't even called and told me that, so we were having a party with green yes. beer and all that stuff, and I get this huh. call and said, oh, uh, by the way, you you, you got to be in Richmond Monday. You're the acting assistant superintendent. Yeah. I, uh, you know, Richmond, if you, if you know now, they have a Rosie the Riveter um, museum there. Because they made the ships there, I guess, during, oh, yeah. the, during World War II. Yep. And yep. a lot of the women worked there. So now the national parks have a, it's called Rosie the Riveter Park. No, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. And they, they tell that whole story. And Richmond's a pretty famous industrial place outside of uh, San it Francisco. Is, it, it I don't is. think people realize San Francisco being as as industrial and how the war really changed San Francisco um, yeah, it, a great uh, deal. And right next to our yard was a uh, major uh, refinery. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, mm -hmm. when I was back there, it was Standard Oil. But, I mean, it was huge. Um, I was just reading about uh, that you were, at that time, well, no, I guess this is when you, when you went back to, uh, to Emporia, Kansas, as a, uh, a superintendent. Um, and right at that time, you were dealing with de derailments. Was that uh, a common problem or a constant problem? Why was that happening at that, at that time? Um, well, it, it, back at that time, again, the Santa Fe was much differently operated than Missouri Pacific. I mean, mm -hmm. Missouri Pacific was a very tight-run organization. Of course, Santa Fe was long haul and you know, the three top railroads in the country at that time were Union Pacific, Santa Fe, and Southern Pacific because of the long distance hauls and so on. But uh, uh, again, you know, they were uh, extremely uh, kind of a state or organization. Mm -hmm. But they let the general managers run their regions uh, almost independently, which was certainly not the case in Missouri Pacific. I mean, they they had an operations control center like everybody does now, mm -hmm. and they made a lot of the decisions across the railroad. But a, a general manager, so you had the coastlines, which was out on the West Coast, mm -hmm. and that's where I started out. Yes. Then you had the Western Lines that was in Amarillo, and then you had the Eastern Lines that was headquartered in Topeka. So the coastlines was basically gold-plated. I mean, you talk about high speed. We had a general manager that, I mean, he wanted, you know, we ran those super sea trains 79 miles an hour. And if he was 
on the rear of that train in the business car, and it was going one mile an hour less than 79. He'd get on the radio and tell him, you get this up to 79 miles an hour. I mean, so it was gold-plated. So I, then I go back to Emporia, and you had a totally different general manager that was determined that he was going to make his reputation by saving money. So what did he do? Really cut back and deferred the maintenance. Mm -hmm. So literally mm -hmm. the first six months that I went back as superintendent, um, that I, I did nothing but go to derailments. And I told this story before, mm -hmm. but it was on July the 5th that Amtrak uh, derailed out there. And I had to go to that derailment and it was a track condition that a switch. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of the lowest points in my life. You know, here I am, uh, I just turned 30 in, uh, in June. And uh, so I go to this derailment on July the 5th and I'm pulling people out of the cars. And it was a, a very tough situation. Was, it, were but, anybody, was that anybody killed? Pardon? Were, were, were there any deaths or injuries? Uh, or what? Actually, uh, two people uh, passed away, but it was not actually from injuries uh, that were uh, from the train derailment. Uh, uh, they actually had heart attacks. I see. But yeah. I'm sure the, sure the derailment had something to do with so that. You're, so as, uh, after these uh, incidents occurred, your... You're, um, mandate, I guess, or your priority was to, as you put, said earlier, fix the road and make sure the road was was safe and, and, and uh, efficient. So that was your your next big challenge, I guess. And, uh, yeah, and they, you know, and, I, and I'll tell you, they, uh, they were going to get, there was talk about getting rid of me as the superintendent, you know, and they're saying, you know, this, this guy's, because the next youngest superintendent to me when I was 29 was 40 years old. I was the next youngest and he was the only 40 year old and all the rest were in their 50s and 60s. And, and you were 30? It, I was 29, 29. When, when I became the, yeah. the superintendent and uh, so um, anyway, you know, the, 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 in fact this one assistant general manager uh, that I worked for, he you know, he, mm -hmm. he was not, he didn't like me all that well. In wow. fact, he had been in Los Angeles running the L.A. terminal when I was uh, train master at San Bernardino, and he didn't much like me. And then he became my, my boss. But anyway, so there was some question about whether they were going to move me because they were saying, you know, this guy doesn't know how to manage, uh, uh, run a, a division and so on. Larry Cena stepped in and said, uh, no. Nah, we're not moving him. We're moving the assistant general manager, his boss, to the other end of the grand division and uh -huh. bringing this new guy in. And we're going to see to it that this guy gets the money uh, to do this. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh. and it was it, it, the the track was actually in horrible condition. And uh, I, I let him know. You know uh, uh -huh. that was before Mister Cena. Uh, but one of his representatives came down. They wanted to fire the uh, uh, engineer, uh, division engineer, and blame him for it. And I said, you know, it's not his fault. It was done at a much higher level. And incidentally, in Chicago, you approved all this. So it's not his fault. It's your fault. So it's a wonder I didn't get fired. But but at that point well, in time, I was, you know, 30 well, years you were, old. Well, you so. were accountable. And I think uh, accountability is is part of being a manager you know and i think that, that yeah, uh, very sometimes much so. sometimes the ten sometimes the tendency is let's kill the messenger but you were the messenger who said you know we're not going to have we're not going to be in business no matter who the superintendent is what was the path and i was just reading this um uh 1989 uh, is, this is going to be the 30th anniversary this year of your becoming um uh, President, I guess, of of the Santa Fe. Right. So, what's the path from 1974 to 1989? Those 15 years. What was that path that got you to that point? And you were the youngest uh, person ever ever appointed to. Well, I was uh, well, at least in that in again, the 20th I, century. Yeah. I was in Emporia uh, for four years, and then they moved me down to uh, Temple, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, that was on the the uh, western region. And uh, 
Jim Fitzgerald was the general manager at that time, and so I went down there, and uh, that was one of their busiest divisions. And uh, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, they said that uh, they wanted me to go down there because they were going to build the hump yard down in the temple, and they wanted me to be in charge of it. And mm -hmm. I am totally opposed to hump yards. Oh, and why? So, yeah, well, because I just, uh, in, as far as switching cars, and so on, you can show efficiency, but if you're going to manage uh, carb movements from origin to destination, you don't send them down. Like I used to uh, block the traffic in Richmond, California that was going to Kansas City and to Chicago and to Texas, and it would be back there in 48 hours. Well, they told me, just throw all this together, we'll take it to a hump yard in Barstow, and then, so it ended up mm -hmm. spending a day in I Barstow. Mm -hmm. and in fact, it ended up we added 36 hours to the transit time. So I was against a hump yard, and I told them, I said, well, by the, the time you look at the, the coal trains that were operating, the intermodal trains, the grain trains, the sulfur trains, and all that, mm -hmm. what are we going to hump? Yeah. And I said, you know what we need down here is a mainline fueling facility because we were changing all mm -hmm. the engines out and it, mm -hmm. it was a mess. And so anyway, we put in a mainline fueling facility, not a hump yard. It yeah. worked out really well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm asking that because in, in Galesburg, of course, is uh, this major hump yard that, yeah. uh, that is quite incredible for someone like myself to come and, and, and see the operation. But I but from your perspective, there are other ways of doing that, accomplishing that. So Yeah, I'm, uh, I just have never been... You know, I'm not totally opposed to hump yards and the productivity, I mean, clearly is there. But again, you know, today what I hear called the precision scheduled railroading. Yes. Uh, you know what I call that? Railroading 101. And back in the days of Missouri Pacific, that's what you were taught that you minimized uh, the a time that a, a, a car got from origin to destination, mm -hmm. not only uh, to, be, to be able to increase the transit time, but also to reduce the cost. And so what you would do is set up a transportation service plan, and then you would execute that plan to minimize the handling of the, of the cars. And so I, that's uh -huh. just, that's what I believed yes. in. And, mm -hmm. I, and I just yes. didn't think that run them through a hump yard and, you know, uh, we had people say, boy, you know, we had, we humped uh, 1,800 cars today. Man, that's a new record. I said, well, you know, you don't look at the productivity of how many cars you hump. How long did it take the car to get from origin to destination? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was your metric, I think. That's what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And, I still, and I still, and there was a fellow that uh, worked for me uh, at Santa Fe named Don Gill, who was ended up being the at Fort Madison and and then came up and it was our transportation guy and he and I both refer to this concept as railroading 101. Mm -hmm. So June 1989 you become president. What was in your mind at that time uh, that what you wanted to accomplish? Um, uh, major Well that's major uh, goals. That's that sounds like the question Rob Krebs asked me when I was uh -huh. uh, named president. But uh, uh -huh. you know, just just for the record, you know, uh, uh, we had gone through a takeover attempt in '86, and the, the railroad was struggling, and the Reichman brothers and Sam Zell uh, mm -hmm. came in in 1988, and they brought McKinsey in, and. Uh, uh, then the uh, John Swartz, who was president of the railroad at that time, decided to step down. And so there was a search for a new president, and there were five in inside candidates. And I was not one of the five inside candidates, mm -hmm. but um, I, I was the vice president of operations and worked very closely with McKinsey. And uh, I th they went to Rob Krebs and said, uh, uh, because one of the fellows... Uh, dropped out the insiders. Uh, he had been the uh, uh, head of the oil company that was one of the subsidiaries of Santa Fe Industries. And so he went to Houston, so they had to put somebody else in his place, and I was selected to go in there. So I was the dark horse. This was like 
five months before, four months before they decided uh, to pick the president, and I was the dark horse, and mm. ended up that McKenzie, I think, recommended uh, Rob Krebs that I that I end up uh, mm -hmm. being the uh, president of the company. And so, anyway, so when I went, uh, the the one thing I felt that the whole industry had failed in doing mm -hmm. was dealing with the labor issues. You know, we had been. Um, the Staggers Act deregulated the rail industry, which saved the rail industry. Mm -hmm. There is no question about that. Mm -hmm. But through the 80s, the railroads did not really cut the cost the way that, that they should. And so, you know, in the old scheme, when it was regulated, you know, the game was that you'd go to the Interstate Commerce Commission and ask for X number of uh, percentage increase mm -hmm. and rates and so on, knowing that you were gonna, not going to get that. But then, uh, so you'd get what you asked for and then you passed it on to the unions. So, you know, uh, so it was just, that was kind of the game they played. And all of a sudden, in a deregulated environment, you know, we went through most of the 1980s and the industry uh, did not. Uh, really deal with some of the labor issues. We did uh, get rid of cabooses, uh, mm -hmm. which I mm -hmm. spent a lot of time testifying that we didn't need cabooses anymore. And being mm -hmm. a former brakeman, I testified in New Mexico, yes. Texas, and mm -hmm. all over and mm -hmm. so on. But anyway, so when I, when I came in, one of the things that I wanted to do was to reduce the crews and change the work rules. And that was one of the things that I told Rob, that I wanted to do, uh, plus, uh, you know, uh, uh, we wanted to get rid of a bunch of branch lines and short line that, and we wanted to change the way that we did intermodal to where it was more focused on profit and so on. Sure. Had a lot of objectives, but really the number one objective I had was we had to do something about the labor unions and changing the work rules. And, and Rob's reaction to that was, hey, you need folks on something else. I've been trying to reduce crews and so on for uh, 25 years, mm -hmm. the industry has, and they haven't been able to do anything. But, right. but I told him, I said, you know, I've actually been meeting for quite some time with labor unions and uh, so on. And, and we actually had a couple of labor unions uh, that the employees got rid of the union, and that was the yard masters and then the police, the special agents. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, so so we were, we, we treated people well, and we had that reputation. And so I, I said, you know, I'm going to focus on this. And I, I made a joke about it. I said, you know, I'm going to go all over the railroad and talk to people and if I have to stand on the corner of Winslow, Arizona, uh, to tell these people we've got to change the work rules mm -hmm. and change the size of the crews and extend the crew districts and so on, uh, you know, I'm going to do that. And, and so, in fact, I, uh, I did go to Winslow, uh, Arizona, and I went to Needles, California when it was 118. I was in Chillicothe, uh, wow. Illinois, and was not very well accepted and so on. But we dropped out of the national negotiations in the industry, and that's when I kind of got the reputation of being a maverick mm -hmm. within the industry. They were not happy with me, but uh, we established uh, the work rule con concept and also the reduction in crew sizes that has that that changed the entire industry mm -hmm. so if you look at the rail industry from the end of the 1980s up through the 1990s and you look at the total number of people that were in the industry say back eight, 1989 1990 because we actually uh, uh entered into this in 1990 but uh and then the the, the uh, whole industry got into it uh at the beginning of 1991, there was going to be a nationwide strike, but the Congress stopped that. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so, so the productivity, you, you went from there were like a million people uh, in the rail industry to, to within 
10 years, it was down to 250,000. Mm -hmm. And then, and mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. look at the productivity mm -hmm. and, you know, it was about, you know, 160 or 70 percent of what it was uh -huh. when you had all those other people. Yeah. So that's yeah. what the industry had to deal with. I mean, you did not need firemen mm -hmm. on locomotives that yeah. hadn't shoveled coal for right. 50 years. Right. You didn't need all these brakemen and so on when you got uh, all these different yeah. devices that can line the mm -hmm. switches with centralized traffic control and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And you just you just didn't need all that stuff. So you didn't need the people. And so that I think that that was the biggest change mm -hmm. in, in the industry. So, um, I mean, you make it sound, I know it wasn't easy, but what was the, what, were, there, were there any people within the union that, that started to agree with you and said, uh, you know, we, yeah. let's, uh, let's try to phase this in or, or let's, uh, um, you know, who finally recognized that it was in their interests also to, uh, to make these changes? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, when I went out and I had all these town hall meetings and I talked to these people, uh, and there were, there were union representatives that showed up there all, all the time. And um, But what I would tell them is if we don't change uh, what we're doing right now with the crew sizes, the crew districts, I mean, you know, a day's pay was 100 miles. That's an average of 12 and a half miles an hour. That was established back, you know, in the early 1900s when that's about what a train averaged. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, if we don't change, the Santa Fe is going to be gone. And it's not going to be that the tracks are going to be ripped up or it's going to disappear. But instead of working for the Santa Fe, you might realize you were, might work for the Frank Lorenzo in Western, and Frank Lorenzo was the guy that took uh -huh. over TWA you know, uh -huh. and, yeah. and throughout all the yes. unions and so on. Mm -hmm. So they so they listened, and mm -hmm. I mean, I talked to these people everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. I was in Bakersfield. I went into union halls. I went to Temple, Texas. I'd never been a management guy ever gone in there. In fact, I also went to Lubbock, Texas, and mm -hmm. some union guy got up there and started attacking me, and I ripped him, and, and all the rest of the people in there started clapping, you know, and, uh, huh. and uh, uh, but I told them the way it was going to be. So anyway, the, the, believe it or not, the, the ones that were most amenable to doing this was out on the coastlines, mm -hmm. and then the western lines was pretty amicable as well. The eastern lines that fell out of Kansas City was not so much, but the majority of people were willing to vote for it. So anyway, we uh, made the change uh, at Santa Fe that then set the precedent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the entire industry. Yeah. So that that was one of the biggest objectives I had, and and also reducing cost and proven service. Well, we're going to get into intermodal in a moment. Because that's the big turning point. Um, th did you ever? Were you ever a member of the union when you were uh, yeah. brakeman? And mm -hmm. uh, so you had a card, a union card. Yeah, I was the, I was a member of the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen that eventually then became the United Transportation Union. Oh. And uh, so, uh, yeah, all, all my family. Well, that must have helped uh, in your credibility when you'd go to these meetings and you could say, "Hey, I, I, I've been, I've done these jobs," you know. Oh uh, yeah, and. Yeah, I've, yeah, and and that's that's the one thing that I do think that the employees did respect mm -hmm. that they that they knew that mm -hmm. that I had been out there and yeah. I'd done that and you know like when I would go out on a business uh, car and say we would stop or something and there would be a track gang out there working on the railroad and so on I would al always go down and always shake hands mm -hmm. with them you know mm -hmm. and I'd say no oh, you know the president. But, you know, I did that at one time, so yeah. I, th I thought that was yes. important. And, I, and you know, I have respect for these folks that have to work all these hours and weekends and nights and so on. It's a, it's a tough situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've told this story uh, and you, uh, many times, but you became uh, president of the railroad in 1989. Right. And almost immediately that same year, you entered into this agreement with... J.B. Hunt was it? Uh... Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And so, uh, in addition to sort of tackling this uh, labor issue, which was really on your mind, this sort of revolutionary uh, or historic moment also was was about to take place. Can you? 
Yeah, it was, uh, there were a lot of things going on, not just the labor relations changing, you know, the work rules and crew sizes and so on. But again, we uh, sold off at least uh, 20% of our railroad uh, to short lines. Mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. But we kept 93% of the uh, revenues. And then we also uh, focused on um, the return on uh, business because instead of thinking about volume, we were looking at profitability. And who was the uh, fellow that I assigned when I became president to do that? Carl Ice, who is now the uh, CEO of the BNSF. Uh -huh. He was the guy that mm -hmm. started uh, measuring uh, profitability of all of our traffic. And, and we demarketed a lot of traffic. So, what you does know, that we, mean? What we, is demarketed? What do you mean? Just, uh, uh, just well, got like, out of that market? Uh, like, yeah, know. like intermodal business between Denver and Dallas and Houston. Uh, the BN had a much more straight route, and we had a circuitous route. Mm -hmm. We'd have to come clear back through Kansas and then go south. I see. And we were losing money on every load. And then also we were shipping intermodal from Denver to Los Angeles. Well, the UP had a straight shot out there and uh, Southern Pacific as well. So it just didn't make, so we we just demarketed or got rid of that kind of business. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, at that time, a lot of the Wall Streeters were coming back and saying, man, your loadings are going down. And I said, don't look at the loadings, look at the profitability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and that, that subsequently led you into this uh, partnership Partnership with because uh, I was reading the difference between the truck truck or trucking companies being a customer or you being a customer, but yeah. you were really in it together. Yeah. Well, it uh, actually, you know, I mentioned earlier that McKinsey had come on the property right. in 1988, and I had been trying to tell them that w we should team up with a trucking company. Uh, when you looked at all the transportation competition in the United States. We didn't need to go out and buy a trucking company. We had already owned one at one time that failed because railroaders don't know how to run trucking companies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't need to have a subsidiary. What we should do is team up with a trucking company. So actually, McKinsey uh, went to the marketing people at that time when they were on the property in 88, and they said, hey, you know, Haverty said we ought to think about teaming up with a trucking company and they said you know the reason he's in operations is because he doesn't understand anything about marketing and trucking companies and railroads will never be able to work together well uh, then a few months later I was named uh, president and and I've told this story before but actually when I got my MBA at the University of Chicago I had clear back in 1982 I had written a thesis for my marketing course saying that a trucking company and a railroad should team up because mm -hmm. railroads are great over the long haul, but, but trucking companies can go to much shorter distances uh, much more efficiently than railroads. So to me, it was common sense, logic, mm -hmm. but nobody really wanted to do that. So after I became president, I took this fellow that was leading the study for McKenzie's name was John Russell. And then I also took the uh, professor uh, that I had from the University of Chicago that was in the marketing department when I had written that thesis. And they say that the old saying is that a picture's worth a thousand words. So we put business cars on the rear of an intermodal train and we took off. And I kept trying to tell McKenzie, you know, that you just don't understand the, truck, the trucking business out there is just eating us up. So anyway, we get out going through to Mexico on Interstate 40, which was literally 30 yards away from us. We're running 70 miles an hour, and we had a three-man crew at that time. And uh, these trucks out there were just almost bumper to bumper. And that was when they had the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit, mm -hmm. although they were mm -hmm. running faster than that. Yeah. But anyway, I said, and their jaws just dropped. They could not believe how much traffic was out there. And this is literally what happened. I said, I, I didn't know 
J.B. Hunt from Adam. But a great majority of the trucks that were out there on Interstate 40 were J.B. Hunt trailers and trucks. I said, I bet you if I could meet J.B. Hunt that I could convince him that his trailers would be better off over on the steel highway than over on that concrete highway. So anyway, John Russell said, you know, we've done some business for J.B. Hunt Transport. Let me see if we can set up a meeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, two weeks later, uh, we flew down. I took uh, Don McInnes, who was the head of our intermodal uh, department at uh, that time. Ab Reese was our vice president. Operations, uh, Owen Zadar was in the intermodal. We took him down. And John Russell. And we then decided that we were going to try and tell them the story of why they should do business with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. And this this is in, like, the fall of 89? or the uh, This this was in... Uh, I took them out in October uh, of uh, 1989. Okay. And uh, then two weeks later... It was right around the first part of October. And so then uh, two weeks later, they set up a meeting. And uh, we were not supposed to actually meet with JB. Uh, we were going to meet with Kirk Thompson, who was the president of JB Hunt Transport, and Paul Burgeon, who was the head of their marketing department, also their legal department. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we went down there and we went to Lowell, Arkansas and walked into his office. That's where it used to be. It's in Rogers now. But mm -hmm. um, And here's this guy standing there in his cowboy hat, uh, cowboy boots. And he says, hey, I'm J.B. Hunt. And I said, I'm Mike Haverty. And <laughs> anyway, we went into the meeting and uh, we really hit it off. And every railroad in the United States had been to see him and wanted uh, J.B. Hunt Transport to be a customer. And he said, I don't want to be a customer. He said, if we're going to do something, it's got to be a partnership. And I said, you know what? I think we can do that. So uh, he was going to come up to uh, American Trucking Association, ATA meeting two weeks later. And he was staying... Uh, at the uh, Conrad Hilton right down the street from Santa Fe headquarters. And so I invited him up uh, to take a train trip. And I went out to Corwith Yard and made sure <laughs> everybody cleaned everything up because uh, yeah. he liked uh, everything nice and clean. And his drivers wore uniforms like UPS and, mm -hmm. and so on. And they washed the trucks. And so anyway, we had everything gleaming and we had the war bonnet uh, locomotives on the, this uh, intermodal train we were getting ready to to take off on. And at the rear, we had some uh, cars on the rear, and uh, then we put one of his trailers right in front of a business car so we could stand out on the deck there and watch that. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, that trailer had road. And so anyway, we take off out of Corwith and Interstate uh, 55 is totally backed up, bumper to bumper, and uh, we're going 70 miles an hour and so on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, that, this story has been told many, many times. Uh, he is the one. It was We were sitting across from each other, and he's the one that got up and walked over to me and said, Haverty, we got a deal. And I said, JB, what's the deal? He said, I don't know. <laughs> but he said, we're going to do a deal. And based on that handshake, mm -hmm. we did not have a formal agreement. And I assigned uh, Carl Ice to help negotiate the agreement. And then also a, a lawyer named Rick Weicker, who I thought a tremendous amount of still do. And uh, and they negotiated the agreement, and, and we did. We we shared the revenues mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. and it uh, turned out to be a tremendous uh, thing for us. I think, you know, by the time uh, we got the final agreement done, I think we were doing $30 million uh, business, and, and I, I just went... Uh, the other day, uh, the other night, to uh, Matt Rose's retirement party, and I saw the fellow that now 
is uh, dealing with J.B. Hunt, and he told me in 2018 they handled 1.5 million uh, J.B. Hunt units on BNSF. So that wow. handshake went wow. to 1.5 wow. million, and the revenues are about 1.5 billion. So, and and that was the first time in the industry that that happened. Yes, wow. and and you know as uh, many things that I've done my career, like investing in Mexico and mm -hmm. so on and mm -hmm. different things, people said, you know, he's crazy, he doesn't know what he's doing, it's never going to work. Trucking companies hate each other and so on. But, yeah. you know, take a look at these uh, trains now. And, yeah. uh, Werner well, I know, and I, Schneider, and they, they're all on board. I had the privilege of meeting um, Mr. Uh, I think it's I think McKinney Marsk, Marsk Moller from Denmark. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he uh, was a big uh, contributor to the Smithsonian. And I asked him um, why he gave uh, several million dollars to the Smithsonian to for our Maritime History Hall. And he said, well, during World War II, I was ex exiled from my country, and I ran my, co my company out of New York, and I wanted to give something... To, to America, but Maersk uh, has quite an intermodal operation. They were uh, our biggest um, ocean carrier uh, business at Santa Fe, and uh, uh, our biggest customer was UPS, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we ran trains that were almost ex exclusively UPS traffic, and then we ran trains that were containers, double stack, Maersk containers, and we had a tremendous relationship with Maersk. They were our biggest uh, customer. Did you ever meet him? Uh, you know, I actually, uh, I did meet him, and you know, the ironic thing is that his wife is from here in Missouri. I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, it, it, out on, uh, uh, you know, I can't think of the town right now, but uh, on our line mm -hmm. that runs between here and East St. Louis, she was uh, she was born out there. Huh. And in fact, we wanted to uh, put a put a monument up there because, uh, and uh, I had actually gone to to uh, Copenhagen, and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. but uh, he did he didn't. He he was a guy very low key. Yeah, he he, he gave us several million dollars, and yeah. he didn't want his name on the yeah, gallery. Yeah, exactly. That's the uh, kind of person he was. And his staff told us, and you'll appreciate this, they didn't even know. He just went to the post office himself and mailed the check, uh, and hadn't even told his staff that he was doing it. That uh, would be that would be typical. Yeah, That's why quite, he ran. Quite his an company. honor to meet him. I just thought you'd, you'd enjoy that. So I mean that that that. Um, that really revel that this handshake, which occurred, in, were you were you stopped at Galesburg? You were just no, passing through. No, and, and, and the date was uh, November first, nineteen eighty nine. Okay, and, and the train, it just was by total chance that it was going through Galesburg, and we were running from Chicago to Kansas City, mm -hmm. and uh, of course that's a high speed line there, yes. and. Uh, he was uh, extremely impressed, and yeah. as you saw yeah. on the video that we yes. talked about that. And, yes. And, uh, well, I'm not going to ask you to go back through that yeah. again, but I think that, that these are great stories, and, and again, in talking about turning points in the industry, this has got to be one of the one of the big ones. The Staggers Act you mentioned earlier, which was eight nine years before. But it still took that much time before the impact really was was beginning to be felt, and and uh, the yeah. deregulation, the the ability to work out. Could you have worked out a a deal like that under the old uh, no. old rules? Would have never happened. Right. And uh, I will also tell you that uh, under the old regulated environment, uh, I would have never been president of uh, Santa Fe. Uh, again, it was everything yeah. was. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of politics and you know and all that and sure and I was not been cut out of that mold and so anyway I would have never made it I spoke out and said what I thought needed to be done and we did it and that was it so you um, 
We stayed with the with the Santa Fe for another six years. You were only there for no. Uh, oh. I, I was there for uh, two years as president. As president. Yeah. In fact, uh, when I was named president, I was uh, forty four. I was actually the youngest president in a hundred years since William Barstow Strong. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, but anyway, uh, what was happening is we were selling off all of the assets or spinning off all of the assets of Santa Fe I Industries see. and going mm -hmm. back to being a, a pure railroad. And Rob Krebs was the chairman and CEO. And I was the, uh, uh, and, and it was, he's only a little year and a half older than I am. Uh -huh. And uh, so it finally had been, uh, by 1992, uh, I could see that he wanted to run the railroad. And I decided that you really didn't, need two uh, people to run the same railroad, so I decided to move on. And you, you respected him, though? You yes, thought, you know. and it, it was uh, because of him that I became president. If it not, had not been for him, uh, and I, right. you know, I told the Lexton group that, and I've said that before publicly, uh, it, it was because of him that I was became president. I mean... McKenzie recommended me, but he was the the person that was making the decision. Uh -huh. But two years is a relatively short tenure, and then you you stepped aside and yeah, and, but we, uh, we your own. We turned that company upside down yeah, in two I'd years. Say in two years I, I, the, I the used to have customers and, yeah. come and say, "Well, what are you going to do next?" I mean, yeah. but the, we didn't have all, we didn't have all the service failures that you see with a lot of changes now. Mm -hmm. Did it take a, a personal? Uh, effort take a lot out of you with, uh, with that many changes in two years and extremely stressful yeah yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, very stressful and and you will recall and you know that I actually had a couple of heart surgeries mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah. anyway so when I took off uh, uh, and I left I actually I took a year off mm -hmm. and just spent time with my family that I hadn't had an opportunity to do and went to see my son play baseball. We took a family vacation mm -hmm. to Hawaii. And then, then I formed my own company and, uh, Haverty Corp, uh, that looked at transportation investments. And, uh, so, uh, but anyway, I, I took some time off. I, I was definitely, uh, worn out. Were you, where were you living at that point? Uh, we lived in Naperville. Illinois. Uh, yeah, yeah, Illinois, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now we're moving up. Now we come to here, Kansas City. Right. Well, let's just talk for a, a little bit about your um, relationship with MyJack, uh, because that happened during that time, didn't it? Yes. Um, really, my relationship with uh, MyJack started back in uh, about 1988. And uh, uh, there were some folks that, and again, my Jack was, you know, they build the, the rubber tired gantry cranes, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and they were very much involved in intermodal. In fact, it was Larry Cena who used the very first crane that Jack Lanigan did, uh -huh. and really Santa Fe was ahead of the entire industry and in mm -hmm. intermodalism but because of that but um, anyway because um, of Jack, uh, Mike Lanigan uh, uh, he knew that I really liked Notre Dame football uh -huh. and uh, uh -huh. so he also heard rumors from people associated with intermodal at uh, Santa Fe that that were predicting that I was potentially going to be the president. Now, this was before I even thought I was ever going to be the president. So he started taking me to Notre Dame football games, uh -huh. and he actually he engaged Johnny Latner to be kind of a salesperson for him, and I'd go to games with Johnny Latner and get to be personal friends with him. Great guy, mm -hmm. fantastic guy. And so anyway, that's how I got to to know the the uh, people at at uh, my jack and mm -hmm. uh, you know and that was another thing uh, when i was uh, at uh, vice president of operations uh, uh, we actually 
uh, we were one of the first groups to uh, contract out uh, the operation of intermodal terminals. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did it out in south of uh, Denver at a facility we had there. And, you know, the uh, uh, unions were not real happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But uh, right. that, that's how uh, ITS got started, uh, that uh, mm -hmm. ran terminals and eventually became a huge company that that uh, did outsourcing for virtually all the railroads in North America of handling their intermodal business. So mm -hmm. that's how we got to know each other. I see. So then when you formed your company, so when you left uh, Santa Fe and took a year off, but then you renewed your uh, relationship with them around well, the time? Well, I never really did you know, lose the relationship with mm -hmm. them. I was always very close to the Lanigans. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're almost, you know, like family. Yeah. And uh, uh, so anyway, we kept a relationship. But I started this uh, company up, Haverty Corp. <clears throat> and they actually uh, became an investor in, in the uh, company. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and so we ended up, uh, we invested in a, uh, what was part of the old, uh, South Orient uh, Railroad ran through uh, Texas down to the border of uh, Mexico, and then mm -hmm. they wanted me to uh, go down and look at Argentina mm -hmm. uh, because they had invested in a port down there, and they wanted me to stop in Panama and look at the railroad there, which I did not want to do, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I ended up doing that in April or March of 1994, and that's. And ultimately, we were we set up a proposal for Haverty Corp to run that operation, and my Jack would be an investor. And then things just kind of went silent. So then, when I took over the job at Kansas City Southern in 1995, Mike Lanigan called me and said, "You know, hey, what about Panama?" And I said, "Hey, let's take the plan I wrote up with Haverty Corp." Instead of Haverty Corp and My Jack, it'll now be KCS and My Jack, and that's how we got invested in the wow. Panama Canal Railway. Wow! And and that was probably uh, considered at that time, you know, going back to your your sort of moniker as Maverick, that that must have really been considered out there, yeah, you know, a high risk. Uh, uh, yeah, it uh, was decision. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, nobody could understand that. And I remember some people going down, I think I've told you this story before, with the Smithsonian mm -hmm. and a couple of board members that were in the short line business well, went by and looked at what we were doing with the track in Panama, putting in concrete ties, 136-pound welded rail to run at 70 miles an hour, and it's a 47-mile stretch across mm -hmm. the Isthmus of Panama. Mm -hmm. They said, how could that guy be that stupid to, to uh, do this? Well, I had this idea that we were going to run this like a production line. And guess who our biggest customer was? Maersk. Huh. And in fact, I went over to uh, Copenhagen, and that's what I was doing over there, and tried to get them to invest in the railroad. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they they just couldn't understand what it was that that I was trying to do. But I was telling them instead of running through the canal, taking mm -hmm. twenty four hours to queue up and nine hours to go through, you know, if you've got these units, if you're going down the if you're going down the west coast or down the east coast, drop them off and we'll just shuttle them back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, they couldn't figure that out. But guess who became our biggest customer? Marist. And and guess what the operating ratio of the Panama Canal at at one time was below fifty. It was like forty eight, and uh, it, it was unbelievable. Forty eight meaning uh, that that was the operating ratio. ratio. So, so that so meant that, that meant that the every... uh, the, the uh, contribution margins on the traffic was uh, fifty to fifty two percent. And today, uh, the um, big emphasis is on the operating ratio, which that's another subject, I think, mm -hmm. overemphasis. But uh, 
you know, they, they all want to get down into the 60s or the 50s, but, you know, we had that. Mm -hmm. And we just operated again with, you know, yeah. uh, uh, small crews and, and then, you know, the, the, we didn't have labor unions and the guys would get off the trains and then they'd go and help unload the units, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. So, and, and so anyway, we put all this money in up front with the idea that it would be, you put all the capital expenditures up front. We had a 50 year concession. That railroad literally would last for 50 years with minimum maintenance. Mm -hmm. But everybody just said, man, they're crazy and never going to work. And, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So on, and then we got Amtrak uh, retired locomotives and mm -hmm. painted them in the Kansas City Southern uh, paint scheme. We called the railroad the Panama Canal yeah. Railway Company instead of Panama, so mm -hmm. Panama Railway, so people could understand where it operated. Yeah. So Kansas City Southern was a real, was probably the smallest, right? Of yeah, the, not of the, probably of the class ones. It was the smallest. So you had to be like the the. Um, what was it? Remember when Avis was we try harder or what? what well, I don't know what your slogan was, but uh, you had to really be a kind of a scrappy uh, um, uh, entity within the within the whole industry, right? Uh, yeah, and, and if you go back in the history of Kansas City Southern, it's it's always been somewhat of a uh, scrappy uh, entity and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, back to the days of uh, Arthur Stilwell, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, he did some of the things that some of the bigger railroads uh, did not like uh, in pricing and, and things like that. And uh, and over the years, it's it's always been scrappy. Uh, but um, when I went to work uh, there in May uh, 1995, May 15, 1995, the railroad had actually been up for sale uh, in 1993 and 1994. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, holding company also owned the Janus Fund and the Burger Fund and other financial assets. And uh, the board had decided uh, to get rid of the railroad. Now, when I had Haverty Corp uh, Company, I was down talking to Landon Rowland at uh, Kansas City Southern trying to convince him, don't sell it, expand into Mexico. That's that's the next growth area in North America. But they said that they were going to sell the railroad. In fact, they tried to hire me to help them sell it. And I said, I'm not into selling railroads. I like to run them. But uh -huh. so anyway, uh, uh, they did, did not get it sold. And the chairman, Paul Henson, who used to be uh, the CEO and chairman of Sprint Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he was uh, chairman of uh, Kansas City Southern, came up to see me in February 1995. And and they didn't get the railroad sold uh, because the two interested parties were Burlington Northern and Santa Fe. And, that, and I still will tell you that that was the reason that those two got merged together because there was a very much a concern by Santa Fe that that BN was going to buy the Kansas City Southern uh -huh. and that Santa Fe might be left out. So Santa Fe then merged. And uh, so uh, mm -hmm. KCS was uh, kind of out there on its own. Mm -hmm. So here had been for sale for almost two years. There hadn't been hardly any capital put into it, nothing, information technology. So when I came down in May of 1990. Five uh, virtually uh, people were writing the obituary of Kansas City Southern that it was mm -hmm. not going to survive, and it was only a matter of time before uh, it would be uh, sucked up by mm -hmm. much larger carriers. So, what made you so interested in uh, in heading up a railroad that everybody was was? Uh so so pessimistic about uh, because I did believe and I had been down there trying to tell them don't sell it think about expanding into uh, into Mexico mm -hmm. and, and I mm -hmm. truly believe that so when Paul Henson came up in February I did not know that he was going to offer me the job I thought he was just going to come up to ask me what I thought about the potential in Mexico 
He said, you know, we'd like to have you run the company. And I said, well, the only way I would do that is if the board would be willing to consider expanding into Mexico. And he said, we, we will. And uh, mm -hmm. so anyway, that, so that's why I accepted it. And I remember telling my wife, uh, uh, I said, you know, this is small railroad, not nearly what I went through Santa Fe for two years, which, you know, she was, I would travel constantly and work, you know, lots of hours. And I said, this will be a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> not quite. It was uh, actually, and I, I have actually told a few people that I said, if I'd known what I was going to get into, I probably wouldn't have taken the job. But, you know, as I look back on it, I mean, it's been a very gratifying experience. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, taking that on, uh, now NAFTA had passed in 91, 92? 94. 94. Yeah, it went, went into effect oh. in 1994. Right, uh, but but uh, George H. W. Bush had it's, the negotiation started on yes the, it, the it, negotiation, it while, and yeah. that's how I got involved in it in ninety one when I was still at Santa Fe. I had gone to Acapulco uh, to a uh, worldwide CEO conference down there and got to meet uh, the negotiators, uh, from Canada, the United States and Mexico, mm -hmm. who gave the presentation in 1991. And that's when I said, whoa, this thing is going to be something. And, and I actually wanted Santa Fe to, uh, get interested in this. Uh, but Southern Pacific had had a very difficult situation in Mexico, uh, back in the 60s when their investment down there was expropriated. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, there was not a great feeling about us going down there, although personally I thought that we should do that. And, mm -hmm. of course, then I left, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, and right. and I really did believe in Mexico mm -hmm. and NAFTA, and I still do. Mm -hmm. do you, so um, the, the decision to go into Mexico was that, um, was it a phased approach, or how did you how did you work uh, that through to to finally get into the country, or how to sort of cross the border? Well, one of the things that uh, happened is after I left Santa Fe, uh, J. B. Hunt Transport had actually wanted to get into the trucking business mm -hmm. down in Mexico, mm -hmm. and J. B. asked me. Uh, clear back in uh, 1991 uh, to accompany him on a trip to Mexico as he was looking for a partner uh, down in uh, in uh, Mexico. So we went to El Paso, we went to Monterey, and then we went down to uh, Mexico City, and uh, that's where I uh, uh, met uh, Pepe uh, Serrano, who owned the largest uh, ocean carrier and transportation company actually in all of Latin America. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, I, when I came down in 93 and 94 to talk to uh, Landon Rolo at Kent City uh, Southern, I told him about Pepe uh, Serrano. Uh, and uh, so uh, anyway, uh, as a backup, uh, Landon was always looking at, you know, what if this doesn't happen or this doesn't happen. So he actually sent a fellow named Mike McLean down into Mexico and to look at the Mexican railroad that was going to be privatized. Um, and that decision was made in, mm -hmm. in 95 and, and, or actually they knew by 94 it was going to be privatized. So he went down and he actually met uh, Pepe Serrano, uh, who I had been down there with. And in fact, Pepe Serrano had sent a message through J.B. Hunt to me that mm. if the railroad is privatized, this was when I was running Haverty Corp., mm -hmm. uh, would, would Haverty be interested in coming down and running the railroad down in Mexico? And, and I said no, that I didn't want to do that. Oh. But, uh, but I wanted to hook up with a railroad in the United States. And so that's uh, that's how it came about. But literally the, mm. the second day that uh, I was uh, in office, uh, 
Pepe Serrano sent a consulting team up to see me about making an investment in Mexico. And believe me, I had so much going on. I said, hey, I love Mexico, want to invest in it, and so on. I first got to learn about what Kansas City Southern is. I got to learn the business here and so on. So we'll talk about this. But uh, so I got down here uh, in May and then, you know, just a short time later, uh, I think it was June that the, uh, well, in fact, that the month I got here, the UPC and NW merger mm -hmm. uh, was approved, which Kansas City Southern lost a lot of green as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And then three months later, the BN Santa Fe merger uh, was approved. And then a couple of months after that, the uh, uh, UPSP uh, merger uh, was, or was announced, and it would end up that if that merger was approved, that 90 percent of all rail traffic west of the Mississippi River was going to be handled by those the, those two. And so everybody again said, Kansas City Southern was gone. So I knew uh, that we had to step up the pace and uh, and look at investing in Mexico. And it so happened. Uh, that uh, Serrano's company owned the Texas Mexican Railroad, and uh, mm -hmm. we did not want to have to go before the uh, surface, the Interstate Commerce Commission at that time later became Surface Transportation Board. Uh, so we took a 49% position in, in that, mm -hmm. and this was with all the mergers taking place, and we were the laughing stock of. The industry, you know, here Kansas City Southern runs to Beaumont. It's got a 500-mile gap between Beaumont and Corpus Christi, and uh, you know that. But we had a plan, and our plan was that that the what then became the Surface Transportation Board would uh, would cause the uh, UPSP to spin off some of its lines, and uh -huh. we would pick up a line that would connect down there. Uh -huh. Which that never happened, but we did get trackage rights, uh -huh. so we did have access then to get to Laredo. So we became a legitimate bidder in, uh -huh. on a Mexican concession. Was the uh, and was there was competition for that, <coughs> for that uh, Mexican business? Uh, uh, Who was your competition? I guess uh, Union Pacific totally uh, almost dominated. Uh, you know that they have they have eight different interchange. Mm -hmm. points between the United States and uh, Mexico, and uh, Laredo is the biggest, uh, but uh, Union Pacific totally uh, almost dominated all of the traffic uh, into and out of Mexico, and and there were going to be three concessions that were going to come up, and the first was the Northeast concession that ran from Laredo to Monterey to Mexico City mm -hmm. to Veracruz and then over to um, uh, Lazaro Cardenas, Port of Lazaro Cardenas. And it was uh, given that Union Pacific was going to be, was going to get that. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, but we, uh, we ended up with that. You know, we read so much now about NAFTA and about trade and, and, what specifically about NAFTA made it a game changer, in your in your opinion? What 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 was a provision that that really made it uh, feasible or attractive for you to make this kind of investment? Well, it it uh, knocked down you know a lot of the tariffs, and mm -hmm. you know I've mm -hmm. told this story before, but you know uh, Ross Perot always talked about you know with NAFTA you were going to have this giant sucking sound mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so on and and I've said you know the the only uh, giant sucking sound I've seen is is Mexico buying products and sucking them down into Mexico and in fact Kansas City Southern handles more southbound traffic to Mexico than we handle out of Mexico mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people don't understand that and 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 a lot of these People that uh, grow grain in Minnesota and Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and so on—they're now shipping products down in into Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's uh, 
been a tremendous amount of business there buying our products. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they are producing products down there that come into the United States. But as far as I'm concerned, NAFTA did exactly what it was supposed to do. And if you look at the trade between Canada, the United States, and, and the United States and Mexico prior to NAFTA, and then you come back, you know, years later and look at it, I mean, you know, the growth has just been absolutely phenomenal. Do you think that uh, after 20 years, 25 years, well, 20 years, that, that these kinds of... Um, Agreements should be revisited or, uh, or yes. fine-tuned, or, yes. or so. You're, yeah, you're, you know, I, I think that's true with any kind of agreement that mm -hmm. you're in. You know, right. I mean, when yeah. it's been in effect for twenty years, you know, you, you're going to find out, you know, what what we do wrong mm -hmm. and what are the weaknesses. Mm -hmm. You know, so let's yeah. go back in and let's tweak it and do what we need to do, especially, but uh, you don't, you don't it. scrap it. Yeah. Well, especially in the last 20 years, and, and this is something that I'd be interested in your, you know, we've, we're living in the digital age now. You know, you, you, you remember the, the, uh, cards yeah. in the sixties, but now it's since the, 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 uh, I guess the, uh, silicon and transistors and, and, uh, chips, uh, have changed every, everything. Um, and so even that alone in the last 20 years has changed communications and information technology. And how has that affected uh, your business? Railroad business? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, certainly uh, it has helped improve it. You know, I mean, with signal systems, mm -hmm. uh, uh, PTC that's being uh, put in and... Uh, uh, the way that you can uh, exchange information and uh, different things like that. It's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, the technology has really helped. The thing I say about the railroad industry, though, is, you know, you look at how long the railroad industry has been around in the United States and how many times mm -hmm. people have written it off mm -hmm. saying, well, it's going to die. And, you know, there have been lots of things that, that were not good, in the past, you had robber barons, and then you had poor management, and you had too many unions, and you had at one time the railroad nationalized, and the threat of nationalization, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But when you get down to it, the steel wheel on the steel rail is still the most efficient means of ground transportation that there is. Mm -hmm. So when you take that ground transportation over the long haul, and you take all the technology mm -hmm. that is available to figure out how you can move all the, this traffic and so on, like FedEx does, like UPS does, and so on. Uh, I think the railroads are going to be around for a lot longer. Yeah. I went to a uh, convention two years ago in Indianapolis of the Railway Supply Institute. They have this yeah. amazing, and you've probably been there, I'm sure, and these suppliers, uh, most of whom are... are Relatively small companies that I mean, you've got GE that was I don't know right. GE was make was, make, was making locomotives at one point. I don't know if they're still uh, they're they're spinning that off, but yeah. yeah. But the um, the supply chain of just what it takes to to make this industry uh, work is quite amazing. And I'm thinking about what you would say to somebody uh, considering a career in railroading now. Uh, what would you advise them? You know, what would, uh, you know, what what would be the uh, the path that they might follow to be, you know, following your in your footsteps? Well, I think that uh, clearly they have to be innovative, uh, but in the final analysis, and you know, I'm, I'm old school. Uh, you know, you ha you have to run a tight ship. Mm -hmm. And again, you have to you have to deliver the product on time at uh, a reasonable price, mm -hmm. and and I mean that's just yeah. common economic logic, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so when you get into this business, you need to understand, you know, what is technology going to be able to do in the future? How can it help you? 
plan the supply chain and mm -hmm. work with other organizations and so on to move the products. But in the final analysis, you still got to move it from A to Z mm -hmm. at a reasonable price. And uh, and you got to do it uh, and as expedited as you possibly can. I want to talk a little bit about people. You've mentioned a lot of people who have influenced you. And I had some uh, people who we haven't mentioned. Uh, Paul Tellier. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your relationship with him? How did you get to know him and work with him? Um, Paul actually uh, first... Uh, came down uh, to see me uh, around 1998, and uh, he uh, was interested in a, uh, and I can say this now, it's been mm -hmm. a long time ago, uh, he was interested in a consolidation uh, that uh, might uh, involve Kansas City Southern. And, you know, mm -hmm. the ironic thing is that Kansas City Southern had been for sale, you know, just a few years earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, all the railroads looked at it and come to the conclusion that it just, you know, wasn't the right thing. In fact, uh, Kansas City Southern had bought what we refer to as the Meridian Speedway between Shreveport and Meridian mm -hmm. that is actually the best route. Uh, between uh, the southeast and the southwest in anticipation that Norfolk Southern might be interested uh -huh. in the Kansas City Southern. But anyway, none of the railroads had had been in, in, you know wanted to buy this. And, but then Paul took over and really modernized uh, the uh, Canadian National, you know, and it went from being a nationalized railroad to a privately traded railroad. And what Paul did is just absolutely amazing. And uh, he was innovative, entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. did a just tremendous number of things. But he came down to visit me, and and he thought about, uh, he said, you know, when you think about maybe we can put these companies together, you know, you, you believe in NAFTA and, you know, it'd go from Mexico to the United States to Canada. And I said, yeah, we, we do. Uh, but I said, you know, Paul, we don't even really connect with you you know mm -hmm. we're not and he told me he said uh, i'm gonna buy the illinois central now he told me this long time before he actually bought it but uh he said so we will connect you know we'll connect at springfield illinois and mm -hmm. we'll connect at meridian uh, mississippi and uh, so you know, and I, I never ever told anybody, and I never went out and bought any icy stock or uh, anything. I didn't, right. you know, I just I kept it quiet. But anyway, so you know, he kind of really wanted to do something, and uh, and I told him, I said, you know, uh, you have to to let us develop Mexico and see what we can do there and create value for our shareholders because, you know, basically, you know, with our stock price back in those days, and you can go back and take a look at it, uh, um, you know, I mean, Kansas City Southern was still a holding company, but, you know, and it had it, done pretty well, but, um, you know, we still had a lot to do to create value. Mm -hmm. And anyway, he and I, though, developed a relationship and we ended up, we didn't merge, but we ended up entering into a marketing agreement to where they would move traffic from Canada to Mexico and then move traffic between uh, Mexico and Canada via our, mm -hmm. our lines, primarily going through Meridian. So uh, uh -huh. that we'd, and, and, and Paul and I and our teams uh, would meet uh, literally every quarter. And we'd go back and measure how much business we were doing, mm -hmm. what the opportunities were, and so on. Mm -hmm. But he was a great well, He's leader. going to be a, an inductee uh, for the Hall of Fame. He is an inductee, I should say. Yeah, he, he, yeah. he actually, I think he's, uh, he's already in. I think uh, yeah. he, he and I and one other fellow, I think the only maybe living members. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. uh -huh. And uh, living uh, inductees. Mm -hmm. um, Something you just mentioned, um, and I 
I want to talk about people uh, in, in who we we've, we've sort of mentioned in passing, but something you just mentioned about shareholders and and so much of the uh, reading about business and one of the criticisms of of corporations is that they they are forced into short term thinking because of the shareholder uh, expectations. Can you comment on that at all? How that affected your management and your decision making uh, in in this industry? Well, I'll tell you, there's a uh, tremendous amount of uh, pressure from Wall Street. Uh, there always has been, there always will be. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. their number one objective is the uh, return on investment. But sometimes you, you know, you have to look beyond quarter to quarter to quarter. You know, you've got to look at the long term. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I've always been a long term player. And uh, so we made decisions for the long term. And, you know, if you go back and look at the results, mm -hmm. it turned right. out just fine in the long term. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from quarter to quarter, we didn't always meet the expectations. And, you know, and uh, my response to that is, you know, you need to understand what we're trying to accomplish. And if if you really don't like that, you don't want to do it, then you ought to own some other stock besides uh, us. That's yeah. the way I feel about it. I want to also mention about um, two important women in your life, yes. uh, your grandmother and Marlis. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how they shaped your life at different uh, times? You've talked a little bit about your grandmother. Yeah, I've, uh, I've uh, in fact, when people ask me, you know, who had the most influence in your life and so on, I mean, you know, in the, the railroad industry, you know, I, I clearly looked up to Downing Jinks. I thought he was a tremendous mm -hmm. leader mm -hmm. and his right hand man, John Lloyd, who then later became president of Missouri Pacific, and Larry Cena. I mean, I, you mm -hmm. know, those guys I idolized. But the, the, the people that were most influential in my life, again, were my grandmother. And, and that was because, you know, my mother died when I was six. And so my grandmother had to run, uh, had to raise my brother and myself because right. our dad was out on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. And she was, uh, her uh, maiden name was Strine, Myrtle Strine. So she was a German lady uh -huh. that was totally hardworking, dedicated. She worked as a clerk, a hotel clerk, and uh, she would not pay um, 25 cents to take a taxi to go to work. Uh, she would walk a mile and a half to go to work because she wanted to save the money. Uh -huh. and. Uh, so, you know, she, she taught me so many values and she would also say, uh, even on weekends, uh, you cannot sleep past nine o'clock. You, you're going to get up and, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. And so she, she taught me a tremendous number of values. And then, of course, I lost her and, uh, my father and, uh, and my mother was gone. And so I was out on my own, you know, when I was 19. And as I said, uh, it was challenging, you know, I had one brother and he was yes. married and so on. So I, you know, I ran into my wife, uh, met her in Maryville, Missouri, and that was a life changer mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. If I had not met her, um, I, I may not be here today. I can tell so, you that. so, so, I mean, your success in business is directly... Uh, related, related to that and connected to, uh, to that relationship? Well, you know, my grandmother taught me determination, 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 which is what I clearly believe in. And that, that was a lot of the German, mm -hmm. you know, and have the Irish <laughs> in me that uh, also. But, uh, you know, my, my wife uh, has always been so supportive. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. when I first became an assistant train master and Hearn, Texas, you know, I worked, you know, 12 to 16 hours a day. Uh, and finally, you know, I went six months without uh, having a day off. And, uh, you know, she was home with our daughter and uh, and I just worked uh, day and night. And, and finally, I had to tell the superintendent down there, uh, <laughs> you, you got to give me a day off. Or my <laughs> wife's going to go back to Iowa. And uh, 
but she's she's hung in there with mm-hmm. me through all these good times and bad times. Mm-hmm. Always been supportive, and uh, uh, we've always really focused on family, and uh, that's really important. So if it hadn't been for her, I would have never been where I am today. Um, I'm, you may have some questions, uh, Julie, but I wanted to wind up um, with talking about history because uh, this is a historic year in the uh, railroad industry with the 150th uh, anniversary of the Golden Spike. Um, and um, being with the Hall of Fame, uh, and you're, you're not only in the Hall of Fame, but very supportive of it. Can you talk a little bit why it's important to have a Railroad Hall of Fame and, and, and have this place to honor and commemorate uh, some of the leaders? Well, because I, I think if you look at the development of the United States, you have to say a big part of it was due to the railroad business, uh, particularly as the United States expanded to the West. So, you know, it's a great part of the history of our nation and helped develop this nation and make it what it is today. And, you know, I've always said that you know, our railroad system is the premier railroad system in the world from a freight standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I, I realize that there's other passenger trains and so on. But but one of the things that I think has made the United States competitive in the world marketplace is its transportation system, which includes railroads and trucks, you know, barges. Mm-hmm airplanes and so on, but we have had such an efficient transportation system that mostly has been run privately, that that's Mm -hmm. why we have been as successful as we have been. And it's interesting to see how many of the other countries are privatizing their railroads, Mm -hmm. like Mexico, Panama, Argentina, and you know, you go all, all across the world and, mm-hmm. and they privatized it because they understand that private railroads run better than public railroads. Why is that? Why do they? Management. Okay. Now, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, government uh, can't can't really manage anything you've got to have. I'm a great believer in free enterprise, a great mm-hmm. believer in capitalism. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if it was not for uh, capitalism, uh, I would have never gotten to the point where I rose to because you think about this, uh, you know, the son of a conductor, uh, blue collar conductor becoming, you know, president and chairman, CEO. Uh, if I was, if this was not a capitalistic free enterprise country, uh, that would have never happened. Yeah. What do you think of the future of railroads? First, first of all, who are the who are the up and coming leaders that we should be looking at? Who 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 do you see as being your successors? Uh, your and uh, and in, in, in being taking the lead in this industry, and where are they taking it? Yeah, you know, I, I have to uh, admit this. I'm a, a bit biased. Uh, you know, being a railroad operating. Uh, person uh, in learning the business from the ground up, uh, I happen to think that that is uh, mm-hmm. e- extremely important. And I think there are some very good leaders today uh, in the industry at all the railroads. Uh, I think uh, the one that uh, I really uh, look up to is uh, Keith Creel at mm-hmm. Canadian Pacific mm-hmm. because he has a railroad operating background and i still think that that's uh, extremely important and i can remember that there was a time uh particularly back in the 1980s uh, when the railroad industry uh was no longer uh, regulated that that they said you know hey these old time railroaders uh, got to get rid of them they don't know what they're doing and so mm-hmm. on but mm-hmm. You know, in the final analysis, you, you got to know how to run a railroad. You got to know how to keep the locomotives running, the trains on the track, mm-hmm. the track maintained, mm-hmm. and the basics. Yeah. Yeah. 
And he's he's one of those people you you think has that. Uh, I think he's uh, yeah. I think he's a great leader. But I you know I think that there's some good leaders yeah. right now, and I I I feel uh, very good about the uh, future of the railroad business. And I keep hearing about you know we're we're going to have all these driverless trucks mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And you know and 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 I'm an optimist uh, yes. clearly, but. Yeah. Also a realist, you know, and I, I think about, you know, look at that on the highways today with uh, all the number of trucks out there. Well, just think about that without anybody in there. And and you think about how, uh, how you can go in and disrupt the technology that might be operating those uh, today. I mean, it's it's done commonly mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and so you know and also i say uh, even if you had driverless trucks if you look at the highway system and where a lot of the congestion is whether you have a driver or not they're all going to be sitting there and not moving because of the congestion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so yes you know i think there's a little bit uh, too much optimism um about this and again i'm not against any mm -hmm. of the technology, I am a great believer uh, in whatever form of transportation uh, is the most efficient. That should be what you used. In fact, uh, uh, you know, I've always uh, uh, supported pipelines, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and people have asked me, well, why do you do that? And I said, because I believe if mm -hmm. it's the most efficient means of transportation, you should do it. But I also think that railroads... You know, can take crude oil and so on from certain locations where it moved by pipeline mm -hmm. and move it around, and that's very efficient. So you have to look at yeah. all of the means of transportation to understand which ones are the most efficient. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I was once asked to give a talk to some uh, staff members uh, um, from different cabinet agencies about infrastructure. And I said, I thought that the container that Don McLean, I guess, in uh, North Carolina uh, invented, but around the same time as when the interstate highway system was created. Right. Now, that was a government program. Right. But it's not run, well, it's actually run by the government, I guess. It's, it can't be privatized, although you have some toll roads and right. things like that. But those kinds of um, investments in infrastructure by... Um, by the government, I think are, are really key in sort of jump-starting uh, private enterprise. Don't, don't, don't you agree? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think it's extremely important that we have to uh, have the proper infrastructure. An inter interstate highway system, if you go back and look at history, it just, uh, you know, what, what it's done for our country. Yeah. And again, when I talk about, you know, we, we are the most efficient means of transportation in the world, a yes. big part of that is because of the highway system. The only thing I will say is that the competition that we have in the trucking industry is subsidized from a standpoint that their right of way is paid for yes. by the government, yes. and we pay for ours, and we pay for taxes yeah. for our infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. Last question: We're sitting in this historic structure, which you had a big role in saving. And it's a railroad monument, landmark. Can we talk a little bit about that, what, how you got involved in that? Well, how, the how, Union Station. Yeah, how I originally got involved in it is uh, <clears throat> back in the 1950s uh, when my grandmother would take my brother and I on vacations every summer. Mm -hmm. And she wanted us to see the United States. She wanted the, the two boys, and again, we started doing this when I was probably eight years old, and, uh, and we would go and we would stop uh, and visit all the Capitol buildings and so mm -hmm. on, and she, won, she would take us, and I mean, we'd go to Seattle, to Miami, to Cheyenne, Denver, you know, and stop and, and you know, Boise, Idaho, and different places like that. And But she wanted us to see the United States, and she wanted us to see a lot of capital. So we came down here 
and I fell in love with the Union Station, and this was a very busy in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I watched it deteriorate uh, over the years, and Amtrak moved out of here, and the ceilings were falling in and so on. So when I came back here in 1995, they had already decided that they were going to rehabilitate this, and so they were in the process, and it was... Um, it was uh, reopened in 1999, and the focus was kind of on science, science city, more so than the, the transportation side of it. But I wanted to be involved, so I went on the board of trustees of Union Station, although uh, this is actually a private company. This is not a public company, and it's mm -hmm. run by a governing board. So uh, about uh, three years later, I was asked to move up to the uh, governing board. So I was on the governing board. Uh, this station was having uh, lots of difficulties. Uh, they had a uh, $40 million endowment uh, that after spending $260 million to rehabilitate it and uh, uh, the endowment was going down, and there were some people within the organization here that wanted to to tax the people of Kansas City to uh, to again because mm -hmm. we had had a bi state tax, one of the only bi state taxes in history across Kansas and Missouri state lines mm -hmm. that helped build this, and then it phased out. But so a lot of people were wanting to bring tax money in. Well, the People here uh, rebelled and mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And so uh, the uh, chairman that was on there, uh, kind of under pressure, decided to step down. And so I stepped in mm -hmm. uh, and um, in 2005. And uh, that was the year that the, uh, the last of the $40 million endowment uh, uh, disappeared. Uh, that was the end of it. So mm -hmm. we went through some very difficult mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, you might, with your affiliation with Smithsonian, might understand that some museum people don't necessarily like business people coming in and telling them you got to cut this cost and that cost right. and so on. So anyway, I think I, I also felt like we we needed a, a change in the management and so on. And uh, uh, so we went through some tough times, but uh, in, and in fact, I made a comment to a reporter uh, that this is not going down on my watch. And so what did he do the next day? P puts it in the newspaper. However, he says Union Station's not going down on his watch. And so that put a little more pressure on me. But uh, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, so we made a management change in late uh, 2008, brought in a fellow named George Costello, mm -hmm. very creative guy here. That is, and, and I mean, here, 10 years ago, I mean, we couldn't even hardly pay our bills. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was uh, kind of the turning point was in late 2009, and it was about the time we had the dedication of the John Reed locomotive. And I've always said that I think John Reed was looking down here and saying, hey, we're not going to let this thing fail. And, and it's just turned into mm -hmm. it's truly uh, the Kansas City icon. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we just got significant uh, amount of money uh, on hand to be able to do things and keep this uh, great monument that goes back to 1914. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's just uh, fantastic. But I fell in love with this in the 1950s. And when I, even when I was a kid in Atchison, we used to, because the reason we would travel out of here is because on Missouri Pacific, if you went on a Missouri Pacific train, you get travel free on any other railroad you went at half price. So that's why we could travel I all see. over. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, and even when I was in Atchison, I'd ride the train mm -hmm. down here and we'd go to baseball games and uh -huh. things like that. Yeah. So I just have always loved Union Station. I have to ask just one more question. <laughs> um, because as you were talking, um, we've done a number of interviews and we've, we've interviewed um, 
there's one sort of category of of, uh, of leadership, and that's women in railroads that we've been talking to. And can you comment? I mean, this has been mostly a an old guys club. Even even the new even the new wave are mostly mostly men leaders, but that seems to be to be changing. Do you think? And yeah, there? yeah, it is changing, and I think that there are many ladies within the railroad industry that are extremely competent and uh, can someday run a railroad. And in fact, uh, you know, that I uh, was down at Matt Rose's retirement at BNSF, and yes. there's a lady down there that has really done very, very well down there. And there's many throughout the industry uh, that have done extremely well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you're going to see more uh, women uh, in leadership roles, and I think that's a positive thing. Minorities too. Do you think they're more uh, um, African Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, immigrants yeah. from all these different countries, India and, and uh, uh, most? Uh, it's very diversified, and you know, and, and when you think about it, uh, you look at the uh, uh, Hispanic population has always been very influential mm -hmm. in the rail industry. I mean, you know, when I worked on track gangs, I worked with many hardworking uh, men that, that were from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was with Santa Fe here at uh, Argentine Yard uh, in the uh, shops in the mechanical department, uh, many Hispanics uh, there. Yeah. And uh, we've just had some... Tremendous uh, leaders, uh, Hispanic leaders, and uh, mm -hmm. many uh, black leaders are also emerging and women. And so I think diversity is mm -hmm. uh, extremely important going forward. Mm -hmm. Julie, do you have any uh, questions that we didn't uh, pursue? I want to make sure we talk about grandma. Yes. I'm curious if what two or three words you might use to describe your father's personality or character. Um, one tough Irish <laughs> guy. In fact, he uh, he was a boxer when he was young, and uh, he was being recruited to be a professional boxer, and. Uh, <laughs> His parents would not allow him to do that, but he he was uh, he was a tough railroad guy, and I think if uh, you talk to uh, a lot of the people who work for me, a lot of people in the industry, they'd say the same thing about me. He was a tough Irish railroad guy, and then, you know. So, and so your grandmother, I'm guessing she probably was not quite fifty where she when you when you when she took over your care. Yes. Yeah. And that, she was already widowed. Yes. Yeah. My uh, her husband had died, and and she had three children that she had to raise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and one one of her sons uh, was in the Coast Guard, and he got a rope wrapped around his leg, and uh, on the Missouri River down around Leavenworth. And literally squeezed his leg off, and he actually took a knife and cut, cut it off, and so on. Another uh, son uh, was on the USS Yorktown when it was sunk, and he was out in the water and saved some people. And then he got on a second carrier that got sunk. And by the time he was uh, 30 years old, his hair was pure white mm -hmm. because of all the stress that he'd been through. And then, uh, and then my mother uh, had lupus, and so our grandmother took care of her. And then, so my mother died when she was 30 years old. So you you think about this: her husband died. She had to raise three kids, and, and then in addition to you. You, you well, the, and... by this time, she had raised them, you know, and they, they were off on their own by then. And then, yeah, she she did that. 
but then, you know, she really focused on taking care of her daughter, my mother, and she actually, she lived with us out in Stockton, Kansas, you know, when I was born. And so she was uh, my mother's caretaker. And then, so we we moved back here. I was uh, five, and uh, and uh, then you know my mother died within a matter of months after we came back. So uh, was your grandmother born in this country? Yes, yeah, she was uh, born in a little uh, community uh, outside of Atchison called Monrovia, Kansas. So it's a uh, basically a little farm community, mm -hmm. and she she grew up. Uh, as hard workers and her parents again had German heritage and and uh, so I think that's where I uh, inherited a lot of that and then the toughness uh, mm -hmm. came from the Irish side. So so I want to uh, I just have one more your um, your legacy in this industry. Do you have one if you were pinned down and said there's one thing you really want to be known for, remembered for, what would what, what stands out in your mind? I'll tell you what, I think the, uh, probably the proudest thing, you know, I've done a lot of different things that I'm proud of, but I think becoming the president of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe was probably my proudest moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I was 44, so the youngest in a hundred years, plus the fact that the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe was incorporated in 1859, but it was in Atchison where uh, Cyrus K. Holiday came to raise the money to get the company started. So it started, it was actually 10 years before, or nine years before they actually built anything. But to think that I was the son, fourth generation of all blue collar workers and grew up in Atchison, Kansas, mm -hmm. and then to become the president of a company that virtually was named after and started in my hometown yeah. was, was probably yeah. my proudest moment. Well, I would agree that you've had an amazing career and we really thank you for spending the time this afternoon you know, I'm, I'm going over a lot of things that you've been talked about before but this yeah. is really really great to have this uh, time with you and well, I really you. I really appreciate it